Um, I'm, I'm the moderator for uh, Susan Zvacek. Zvacek. Uh, Susan yeah. Zvacek. I always say Zvacek. I'm sorry. Zvacek. That's okay. That's okay. all right. So when good ideas aren't enough, helping our clients with change. And I just want to tell you that I'm very, very uh, pleased to be able to present her because she's somebody that, um, one of the people here that I have really come to admire. She really knows her stuff. So listen up, everybody. Okay. <laughs> Wait, listen up. Susan Zvacek is the Senior Director of the Center for Teaching Excellence in Learning Technologies at Fort Hayes State University where she oversees online course development and consults with campus departments on enterprise level technology adoption. She has worked in higher education as a faculty member, dissertation advisor, and administrator. Her publications are in the areas of distance education, instructional design, and faculty development. And she is co-author of a distance education textbook, Teaching and Learning at a Distance, currently in its fifth edition, and Blackboard for Dummies. She was a Fulbright Senior Scholar in the Czech Republic and is currently working with universities in Slovakia and Portugal on integrating critical thinking skills into online engineering education. Take it away. Okay. Well, today's, today's session is a little bit different from the sense that I'm not really going to be talking about, it's a little bit different for me because I'm not going to be talking specifically about instructional design or technology. In fact, I'm going to be um, addressing the issue of change, which I would suspect for many of you is a topic that you end up dealing with a lot. Um, and I'm going, to, um, I'm going to focus this particular presentation around the idea of helping our clients with change, but certainly the ideas I'm going to be discussing can be applied to changes you might like to make in your own life as well. So. Um, the presentation itself um, is based on a book that I read about a year ago that really knocked me over. I absolutely love this book. I feel like I just about have it memorized. Um, it's called Switch, How to Change Things When Change is Hard. And I would say that change is hard a lot of the times. Um, the book was written by Chip and Dan Heath. They also wrote a book called um, Made to Stick, which is about ideas and um, how to, get, how to get your ideas to become what are called sticky, in other words, that will last. Um, I liked the, the quotes by Chip and Dan Heath where they said, we created the framework to be useful for people who don't have scads of authority or resources. That includes many of us. Very often we have to work with people on the job who don't report to us. We have no authority. So we've got to help them with change in ways other than saying, you'll do it because I say you'll do it. Um, and I love how they say, we don't promise we're going to make change easy, but we can make it easier for you. So let's go on to the first page. There are some surprises about change that they write, that, that they write about. Um, and the book is actually based on an interesting sort of metaphor that inside every person, there is someone called the rider and there is also an elephant. <laughs> Regardless of how big you are, there is an elephant inside you. The rider is on the back of the elephant holding the reins, probably trying to steer the elephant in a certain direction. And so when, when the Heath brothers write about change, they talk about issues dealing with the rider and the elephant. And if you think about that, if you can imagine this person sitting on the back of an elephant holding the reins. Very often, if the elephant wants to go somewhere, you're, you're going to go there. Yeah. So they start, however, by, by talking about three surprises about change. You know, very often we think, oh, well, those faculty, they're so resistant. Well, very often, that's actually a problem with the rider because the rider doesn't know where to go. Okay, so we need to be able to direct that rider. We're going to talk about each of these in some detail. And sometimes what looks like laziness, oh, those people, they're not going to do it because they're lazy, or they're this, or they're that. Very often it's just exhaustion. And we need to motivate the elephant to actually adopt change. 
And finally, what looks very often like a people problem is not a people problem, it's a situation problem. And so they talk about shaping the path. So those three surprises about change form the structure for this particular book. Now what I'd like each of you to think about then is what kinds of changes are you trying to implement at work? Or maybe in your own life. Well, when, when, uh, when we talk about uh, directing the rider, the, the issue there, as I said, can often be clarity. One of the, one of the reports that they, um, that they write about in the book is really interesting because the issue was that um, people in West Virginia were considered to be unhealthy by some folks at the medical school. The people at the medical school said, we really need to work on health. And there had been all sorts of campaigns, exercise more, eat healthy, all of these sort of vague kind of things that we all know. Well, yes, I should get more exercise, and I should eat healthier. That, however, is very abstract, vague advice to give someone. So what this group did at the medical school instead was launch a campaign that basically said, when you go to the grocery store, don't buy whole milk, buy 1% milk. They had a huge campaign focused on buy 1% milk. Now, you might not think that's much of a change, except what they did was, when they went out and launched this campaign, they did all sorts of like strange marketing things. Like they would take a big tube of, like a toothpaste tube full of fat. <laughs> and they would say, guess what? This is what you're drinking when, you, when you're drinking milk. You know, and of course, you know, the elephant inside us goes, ugh, ugh, that's, that's really gross. Because the elephant is the, is the psychological side of this. Okay? So they did things like that. They said, you know what? When you drink one glass of, of whole milk, you're getting the equivalent of five slices of bacon of fat. So they gave some information. They motivated the elephant, but the very most important thing they did was give clarity. They said, buy 1% milk. What's interesting is that the sales of 1% milk more than doubled. Not just, and, and actually, I probably could say that the sales of whole milk dropped by more than half. People were buying 1% milk because now they had one thing they could do, okay, that would in fact make them healthy in the long run, that no amount of someone just saying, you really should eat healthier, would do for them. They got clarity. So um, when, we, when we need to provide that clarity to the writer, when we need to direct the writer, some of the things we need to do, first of all, find the bright spots. Probably something's already going on at your school that is similar to what you want to see as a wholesale change at the institution. Go find those people and recognize them, okay? So finding the bright spots is one thing you can do. Um, another one is be very clear about where you're going to start with the problem so that when, when you begin your campaign, when you begin this change, it's very clear what the critical moves are gonna be because you have a starting place, okay? So pick one place to start. And then finally, point to the destination. What they mean by that is make sure that people understand, make sure that that rider inside you understands the relevance of that change. Why are we going there? Why would we want to do this? Now, one of the problems with the rider, the rider inside us is the logical, rational side of our personality. Okay? So the rider can very often fall into what's called analysis paralysis. It's like, oh my gosh, okay, so I've got this problem, and I've got all this data, and we can end up just analyzing the data and thinking about it and planning and never actually get around to doing anything. So don't let the rider on the back of that elephant become paralyzed by too many choices, by too much data, you need to make sure there's information. But what's interesting is that, you know, information very rarely changes behavior. 
think of, who can tell me, who knows the most about the dangers of smoking? Smokers. Smokers. They hear it all the time. Yeah. They know. Do you think there is one person smoking going, yeah, I'm doing it for my health? <laughs> no. No. They know it's bad for them. They know in detail, but they still smoke. So information does not, does not necessarily lead to behavior change. Okay. Now, I was thinking about, OK, so hmm, how might I use this in my own institution? Well, one of the things that we're, that we're looking at is after last year, we did a little pilot with lecture capture. So now the provost is saying to me, you know, we, really, we want to get this out there. We want people to understand what this is, and we want them to adopt it. We want them using it. But what has happened already uh, is that some people tried it, and then it was like, well, we don't really know where we're going. We don't really know why we're doing this, because there was no destination pointed out. So that's one area that I'm going to be working on when we roll this out to a larger audience, is pointing to what are you going to get to if you do this? What's the relevance? Why would you want to do this? So that we don't just focus on, well, I could do this, I could do this. There's already, the, the critical moves are not that, not that vague. It's going to be easy for us to provide clarity. We can find some bright spots, because there are some people who've already tried lecture capture. The problem, I think, so far has been we don't have a clear sense of the destination. And you know, I heard yesterday on our tour more than one person from UNLV say, well, you know, we're, we're not really sure about lecture capture. We, we're not, we don't really know what the benefit of it is going to be yet. It's like, OK, that's a destination problem. That's something you need to solve before you do your rollout. Because everybody has too much to do. And if you don't have a real clear sense of where you're going, the rider is going to have a lot of trouble getting you there. Um, so if we deal with the rider, okay, the next thing we want to do is then motivate the, ele the elephant. Remember, the elephant is sort of our emotional side. It's the side that we appeal to, um, you know, with um, more what I would call emotional resonance. We need to build that feeling. So the first step on motivating the elephant is find the feeling. Okay, and, and when the Heats write about this, they talk about, they talk about some interesting examples, like um, small wins, you know, building in some small wins. Also, um, one of the examples that they provide is a, just a really interesting um, case where the, the uh, fashion director at Target, okay, this is a woman named Robin Waters. She's the director for all of Target and their clothing lines, their fashion lines. Now, I don't know if you're very familiar with Target, but just a few years ago, they adopted some fairly high-end designers to design clothes for their stores. Prior to that time, however, they were very similar. Target was very similar to other sort of discounters, big discounters, Walmart, Kmart. You would go in and it's like, oh, here's polo shirts and here's blah, blah, blah. If you go into a Target now, the displays are much more focused on color. They're much more focused on highlighting specific designers. And that's because Robin Waters went into those stores as the new fashion designer and, and actually took examples of sort of new lines that she wanted to implement in all of these bright colors and said, look how this captures your attention compared to, well, there's, you know, just the regular stuff they've been selling. So that idea of finding a feeling and appealing to that within the elephant is a, is a, uh, a big example. Another one that they, um, they mentioned was a large, large corporation with manufacturing plants all over the United States and they didn't have a centralized purchasing system for things like work gloves. Well, their budgets were getting cut, and one of the people in charge of purchasing said, you know, I, I think we might be able to save money by centralizing our purchasing. Well, as soon as people heard centralizing, it was like, oh, no, 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 no. You know, all those individual plants 
did not want to hear that. But what that person did was, was go to the board of directors, and he carried into the room a huge box and dumped on the table the 252 different kinds of work gloves that were being purchased you know, in the 10s and 20s by various manufacturers. Now, if he had put up a chart you know, and said, look at this, we're buying these gloves, and we could save this percentage, blah, blah, blah. No, what he did was he carried a box in and dumped them on the table and said, that's someplace we can save money. Why are we doing this? This is crazy. And everyone kind of looked at it and went, you're right, that is crazy. Why are we doing that? So finding that feeling is a big part of appealing to the elephant. Shrinking the change. In other words, you don't have to suddenly eat healthier. You just need to buy 1% milk. Because being told to do some huge change, revamp your life, that scares the elephant to bits. It's like, whoa, whoa, I can't do that. An elephant starts backing up away from change. So the elephant needs to feel like, I can do this. I can do this. How many of you have heard of Fly Lady? Any Fly Lady people? Really? Well, let me tell you about the Fly Lady. Fly Lady has a website and probably a book and Lord knows what all. She writes about house cleaning. Not exactly, you know, a topic that it's like, oh, I think I'll go look at websites about house cleaning. Um, but the thing that makes Fly Lady different is she says, you know what? Don't say, oh my God, I have to clean the basement. Ugh! Because what do most of us do? Well, our elephant goes, you've got to be kidding me. That's, that's insurmountable. I think I'll go lie down for a while <laughs> instead. Fly Lady says, no, you don't have to clean the whole basement. You just need to clean this one little corner or this one shelf. She has a technique where she says spend 15 minutes and then give yourself a break. Do not work longer than 15 minutes. Then take a break. Because even the elephant's not going to be spooked by cleaning for 15 minutes. Right? But you put enough of those 15 minute segments together and you've got a clean basement. So Fly Lady says you're not going to have suddenly a fabulous clean house because you go on a cleaning marathon. What you're going to do is you're going to have 15 minutes this morning and 15 in the afternoon and maybe on Saturday do three 15 minutes. But because you're doing it a little bit at a time, your house just stays clean. There's another um, site similar to Fly Ladies that I won't, I'll tell you the, the initials. Um, it's uh, UFYH and I'll tell you what three of those stand for. The first one is un, and the last two words are your habitat. So um, same un, <clears throat> your, your habitat, same, same, it's a rather colorful uh, site. But the whole idea, again, is shrinking the change so the elephant doesn't get spooked. And finally, um, grow your people. What this refers to is the idea of building identity. And this is something that because I'm new in my job at Fort Hayes State, I've only been there since late last spring, this is something that um, I'll be able to take on because I'm sort of a new entity in their midst. So the idea here is helping the faculty at Fort Hayes see themselves as people who care about learning, as people who want to be innovators rather than just teachers. So helping them build that identity. One of the examples in the book that I love has to do with an elementary school where, which was taken over by a woman who eventually became the, um, the elementary school principal of the year in the United States. She was put into a school in which um, there were severe, severe socioeconomic issues, there were racial issues, and in fact, as she stated it, the school had adopted a culture of failure. Students didn't get good grades, they just failed, you know, whatever. The whole school had sort of bought into that, well, you know, we're poor, we're this, we're that, we're losers. This principal came in new and said, no, 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 we're going to change that identity. And one of the ways we're going to do it is we're going to change our whole grading scheme. Now, one of the areas I like to um, write and speak about is assessment, how we assess learning gains. So I was kind of fascinated by this because what she did was she said from here on out, Students can get one of four grades, an A, a B, a C, 
or a not yet. There's no Fs. You get a not yet. And that little change told those students that we know you're capable. You're just not there yet. We'll keep working with you. Right? So A, B, C, not yet. Just an example of a way to grow your people, a way to build an identity that doesn't say you're a loser, you can't learn. Instead, it says, yes, you can learn this stuff. Of course you can. You're just not there yet. So building that identity, and as I said, one of the things I'm hoping to do is increase the identity of our faculty at Fort Hayes, especially the adjuncts who are easily marginalized, easily left out of things, not because we want to, but because many of them aren't even in the same country. Okay. Helping them develop an identity as an innovator and as a teacher who is focused on quality learning. Not so much a teacher who's focused on teaching, but a teacher who's focused on her students learning, which is more than a semantic difference. Okay, so, we've, so now we're motivating the elephant. But sometimes, when we're faced with change or when we're faced with a problem, what we need to do is change the situation. You know, it's very easy for us to, to look at change, or as I said, you know, we look and say, oh, those faculty, they're so resistant. And faculty look at AV people and go, oh, they're always just throwing equipment at us. Or we look at IT people <laughs> and say, they're not very responsive. This is called the fundamental attribution error in psychology. And what it means is that you're blaming the person when, in fact, the problem is the situation. Think about um, the last time you saw someone driving like a crazy person. You say, God, what a jerk. But think about the last time you drove like a crazy person. <laughs> it was the situation. It's not because you're a jerk. It's because you were 10 minutes late for your dental appointment or your kid's baseball game or you were late to work. That's a situation problem. So sometimes what we have to do is fix the situation. So um, one of the things we can do is tweak the environment. Have you noticed how ATMs work? You don't get your money until what? You take the card out. So you can't leave your card in the machine. All new ATMs are built that way. They didn't used to be. A lot of people lost their ATM card because they forgot to, it would pop out and they, you know, they forget to take it. They're busy getting their money, putting it in their billfold, hoping they don't get mugged, and they leave the card there. Now ATMs are built so that you don't get your money until you take the card out. That's tweaking the environment. The, the, that's making the, the way you want things to be <laughs> the easy way. So we want to tweak that environment. We, know we want to fix it so that people do what we want them to do. We also have to remember that we have to build habits. Change does, isn't just like an event. Change is a process. If you think, how many of you ever tried to train, to train like your dog to do something? Yeah, yeah. You didn't say, OK, you know, sit. And the dog didn't sit, didn't sit, didn't sit. And then finally, one day, it just sat. And from then on, it was perfect. There was, there's never that point, right? It's always an approximation. When you come close to sitting, I'm going to reward you. And then when you get a little close, uh, so you reward the approximations. Think about, you know, like circus animals. For Pete's sake, there isn't a moment when a monkey learns to ride on a skateboard. It's a process. Okay? It's a whole process that occurs because we build habits in the monkey, okay? not because we you know, suddenly, you know, we explained with the PowerPoint presentation, now, here are the steps to writing a skateboard. You know, we didn't, we don't do that. We tweak the environment to enable the monkey to build those habits that lead to writing on a skateboard. Now, this is actually kind of a problem in businesses because it's very easy for us to look at people and say, well, this is a problem, or this is how you work, or this is your style. Has anybody taken the Myers-Briggs, right? You know, you're an INT, blah, blah, EN, whatever. Well, that's fine, and that's helpful for self-reflection and to kind of think about that. But in fact, even though there have been lots of business books and management books written about it, 
It's not that helpful as far as a management tool. Because what the Myers-Briggs does is make that fundamental attribution error. It says, well, here's, this, here's why things are happening this way. It's because you're an INTJ. When in fact, very often, it's not the people, it's the situation. So we need to be very careful about you know, using those kinds of tools when in fact, what we need to do is fix the environment, help them build habits, and then finally, rally the herd. One of the things they talk about, that he's talk about in this book, is that we look to other people for cues about how to behave. Right? Have you ever done that? Have you ever gone somewhere and you're not sure which bathroom is the men's or the women's? What do you do? You wait, you wait for somebody, wait for somebody to come out. <laughs> right? you, or you just see what everybody else is doing. Okay, you follow. You kind of watch, you observe, say, oh, that's what's going on. Well, in fact, what, what they're finding out is that if you, want if you want to change people's behavior, you can reinforce the idea that a lot of people are doing this, and wouldn't you like to go along too? Have any of you seen the, the um, ad campaigns that are aimed at undergraduate drinking at universities where they say 60% of undergraduates at Iowa State University do not drink on the weekend, or they do not drink to have fun. Those kinds of ads are saying, here's your herd, here's your group. If you choose not to drink, you're part of the in crowd because we want to be with the cool kids. And we can do that on the job, for example, by saying, well, you know, the folks, the folks in um, education, you know, half of them are already using lecture capture. Not only does it does it make it okay for somebody to go, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll do that, I'll do that, because it's not me stepping out there by myself going, mm, I'll do this. But in fact, there's a whole bunch of people doing it, so of course it makes sense to do that. What it also does is help us use that sense of sort of possible competitiveness. Well, you know, the people in education are doing it. I don't know why the business school isn't already on it. I'm real surprised, because boy, we got a lot of people in education doing this. Has, has any, have any of you noticed the little sign-up sheets for dinner tonight? Are there any names on them? No. no. <laughs> I, was just, I saw that this morning and I thought, oh my gosh, wouldn't it be interesting, wouldn't it be a great study to like have, you know, maybe you've got two conferences or something, and you put one up, but you put a few names on it already before you post it. Do you think? You'd be more likely to sign your name on one of those groups if somebody else had already signed up? Yeah. Yes. That's exactly, that's exactly why they do that. That's a way of rallying the herd around a behavior. So, you know, but I put, when I saw that totally blank, I thought, oh my gosh. <laughs> this is a perfect example. We're going to wait for someone else to take that step. Then maybe we will. But I would, I, would, I would love to do a study like that, just to see, are people more likely to sign up for something like that if there are already a couple names on the list? I think so, I think so. That's rallying the herd. That's giving people sort of the okay to go ahead. Oh, other people are doing it. Okay, well then, then it must be all right. Um, oh. In terms of building habits and tweaking the environment, um, another example they write about in the book that I think does apply to, to some of the things that we do here uh, includes uh, customer, customer service. Rackspace uh, was a company, or is a company, that several years ago was just really small. You know, they weren't that great, they were doing okay. What Rackspace does is provide cloud-based hosting. They're a hosting company. And when you called them with a problem, you, it was the same, you know, it was what you expect. You get the recording. All our people are busy. Please leave a message. We'll get back to you, blah, blah, blah. You know, and people would leave a message, and maybe they'd hear back, and maybe they wouldn't. Well, a new president came into Rackspace, and he said, no. 
First thing to go, the telephone queuing system. When that phone rings, it rings till somebody picks it up. We are going to answer every support call when people call in. They don't have a, queuing, a telephone queuing system. So what they do is they say, all right, when that phone rings, you pick it up. If you're already on the phone, you pick it up. If you're on the phone, you pick it up. You'd never get a recording when you call Rackspace. They solved the problem right then. What's interesting is how that company grew, partly because word got around. Oh my God, this is crazy. And in fact, the new president rallied the herd around a new slogan, fanatical support. He said, that's us, fanatical support. And that company grew big, 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 really fast. So when we think about you know, how can we build habits, what that president did it was tweak the environment by removing the telephone uh, queuing system. And he said, all right, we're going to build some new habits here. We're going to answer the phone in person when people call. And we're going to solve as many problems on the spot as we possibly can. Rallied the herd around the slogan, fanatical support, and had incredible, incredible success. OK. Um, Make sure that I'm giving you all these examples. Oh, there was one other one that, um, that I saw the other day that I thought was very interesting. Um, and that was, um, it actually goes back to the uh, motivating the elephant, actually, um, that I forgot to mention. I was at a conference last week, and uh, there was a presentation about um, having student assistants in the labs. This was an engineering education conference. And the person was presenting about how they use student assistance to help um, the undergraduates understand what they're doing in the lab and whatever, because one teacher wasn't able to work with everybody. And the presenter said something very interesting. He said, you know, we pay them, but he said, I'm totally convinced that the payment means like almost nothing to these people, but at the end of the year, we have a ceremony where they're recognized, we give them a certificate of appreciation. And he said, you know, every one of those students always shows up. They bring their parents. He said, in fact, what motivates their elephant is not the money, it's recognition. And I thought, wow, what a, what a, what a great example of helping to, uh, you know, as we, as we say, as helping to motivate the elephant. There's a, that feeling that you're needed. We rely on you. We really need you. You have something valuable to give. And growing your people, helping them build that identity. OK. So when facing change, some things to remember. Don't let yourself fall back on well, geez, you know, this person's resistant, or they're lazy, or <laughs> whatever. Identify what the real problem is. Is it a lack of clarity? Do people not know what to do? Think about how you solve problems with classroom technology support. What are the, what are the best kind of directions to put on a piece of equipment? A manual that's seven pages long, or a bulleted list with five items or less? Okay, clarity. Think about, would pe are people possibly just not feeling motivated because the elephant is feeling overwhelmed? We, we see this with our students a lot. Um, one, of the, one of the really hard things for any teacher to do is to provide an, an appropriate amount of challenge to students because what we know about motivation and the, the challenge that the students face is that too little challenge and the motivation's very low, okay? Because it's like, <laughs> I could do this with one hand tied behind my back. Eh, why? But too much challenge, if it seems insurmountable, it's like no matter how hard I work, I'm not gonna be able to do this. Motivation, low. What happens is you end up with this sort of inverted U where the appropriate amount of challenge where it's doable, yeah, I can do this. I might have to work at it. I can do it. That's the peak of motivation. OK? 
right? But that's, that's the hard thing for us, is to figure out where that, where that challenge is. Because too little challenge and too much challenge are both demotivating. So sometimes we have to identify, do we have a motivation problem because the issue just seems insurmountable? Or do we have a, an emo, or a motivation problem because yeah, it just doesn't seem you know, that relevant to me, it's like I don't care, there's no challenge at all? Or we need to identify if the problem is the situation and not the people not the rider who needs clarity about where to go, where to steer the elephant, not the elephant being unmotivated, but simply that the environment is preventing people from behaving in a certain way. Also, when facing change, assume that things could get worse <laughs> before they get better. This is another thing that's very helpful to tell the people you're working with. For example, the lecture capture. What's going to happen, I suspect, is that people are going to try lecture capture and it's going to be difficult. But the point is to help them to push through that and say, no, remember the, remember the first time you used PowerPoint? I had, to, <laughs> I had a great experience about a year and a half ago. A professor said to me, um, he was trying to learn, I can't even remember what software it was, and he said, I just wish this was as easy as PowerPoint. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I wish I could have been there when you were learning PowerPoint. <laughs> because, you know, what, what did you say then? Oh, I wish this was as easy to use as, as Word. Exactly, exactly. So we have to remind people. You know, nobody expects you to, to adopt a change and be immediately good at it. And then finally, remember that small wins Small changes can lead to bigger ones. Don't assume that, well, you know, my school isn't going to be able to do this because we have to change the whole school. We have to change, you know, everything. I, there are actually some people in the education environment who just pretty much, when you talk to them about, like, making changes or, you know, solving some problems or trying something new, their response is, well, no, nothing's really going to happen until we change our educational system. Well, so do we just wait <laughs> until that happens? No. We go for small wins. We go for small changes. Because those, um, those small changes might eventually be that big change. Okay? So remember that those, those small changes can lead to big wins. Okay, so what I'd like to hear from you all is what changes are you what changes are you faced with at your own institution that you're thinking I've got these obstacles I'm not sure what to do no, no. and let's see if as a group we can think about some ways that that we could direct the rider or motivate the elephant or shape the path to help that change occur. So, yeah. Okay, so um, I know you used the example of the lecture capture. I am currently also doing the pilot year of lecture capture. And, um, you know, you were saying that before we roll it out, we have to have the destination. But sometimes it's hard to know what the destination is before you roll it out. So. <laughs> Right. <laughs> We're in this catch-22. So I want to know what you guys are making or other, any other people in the room are doing for their destination as far as lecture capture is concerned. Because right now I'm having a really hard time with people adopting it because it's hard, it's more work, all the things we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, this is actually one reason that I, that I have resisted um, lecture capture because I didn't feel that the destination was one I could get behind necessarily. Um, and it has to do with that whole issue of identity and you know when I said that the whole thing of growing people and you know helping them adopt an identity, um, one of the reasons that I've resisted lecture capture is that I think that it has an unfortunate side effect of reinforcing the teacher's identity as a transmitter of information. Okay, my job is to tell you things, 
And your job as a student is to sit and listen to me. And I think much of lecture capture and how it's used can reinforce that model, which I do not want to reinforce. So I personally have stayed away from it, but am now coming around. And one of the things that, that will be the focus of this is that the destination, ideally, <laughs> the one that I want people to be looking toward, is not that model of, OK, I'm going to like tell you a bunch of stuff and you're going to listen to it and listen to it over and over and over again until the transmission is complete. But that in fact, by pairing it with, OK, you can pre-record your content delivery, your explanation of how to do this, because what the real destination is, is that now in the classroom, you can be doing stuff. You know, the whole idea of the flipped classroom has been that instead of doing homework at home, we're doing homework in the class because now we can take all of that, you know, lecturing, that telling, that content dissemination, and move it outside of the classroom. So the destination, in fact, that I'm hoping to attach to lecture capture really isn't, doesn't have that much to do with lecture capture. It has to do with what can happen in the classroom as a result of using lecture capture. The other thing um, that, that I think will be important with that is to be sure to, to tie um, the idea of, for those faculty who don't use it to pre-record, but who use it um, as a way to you know, simply provide a record to the students to go back you know, and listen to over again, will be to tie that to maybe some specific um, things they expect their students to do with that information. So when you go back and listen to this again, I want you to do this. So expecting the students to use it, but in a, but in a very specific way. So as I said, for me, that's been very much a destination problem because I, I, I did not want to reinforce that model of, okay, I tell you things and you sit there quietly, okay? And that's what lecture capture seemed to be doing. Yeah. We, we've been using it, and we've been using it for specific reasons, so we keep pointing those out to other faculty. We use it for some um, adaptive tech reasons for students to be able to view it up close later. Um, we use it for some athletes that are gone for four hours on Fridays so they're not missing all the coursework. We use it in statistics so the students can go back and look at that one piece that nobody got and they needed to get it um, for review purposes. And our faculty are starting to use it a lot more when they're at conferences and things. And to mm -hmm. capture things that they really want to focus on, they want to do it really, really well with lots of examples, they do it beforehand everybody watch it and then come in and do the discussions things. So we're using those faculty as our examples of things you can do and that has helped us mm -hmm. get more people interested in using it in those types of ways and a lot of other ways. Yeah, a good example of bright spots. You find those bright spots. Look at what this person's doing with it. And ultimately the goal is not the recordings. It's what can happen because those recordings are there, the other things that, that can happen. Yeah, so broadening that destination. We've actually been using lecture capture for several years. Um, one of the main users are our comm instructors. They used to have to bring in a video camera with a tape to record their students' speeches. They now use the lecture capture to do that. It's also used for special events, for speakers, for, um, we have one instructor in our health sciences who has a very popular class, and he has used, he's recorded from the very beginning. So he's recorded every single lecture he has done, and he has used those to create an online winter session class to add to the content so he can do that class more often. Mm -hmm. So it's for the special events, it's not just for, I'm gonna capture every single class so they can look at it later. Right. Although for some students, that is important to be able to review the material if they didn't get it the first time. Right. So it's not just the, I'm gonna stand here and lecture to you. There's lots of other possible uses, mm -hmm. including doing the lecture at home, having that as an assignment, and then using class time for discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and really um, at Fort Hayes, 
Um, we have many foreign students, especially students from China. We have a, a large body of students from China. So allowing them to, to listen again and to listen to something over and over again will, it does make it easier for them just to get that content. So yeah, it's, it, those are great examples. So what other things are you trying to introduce at your schools? We're, I'll tell you one that we're looking at is um, e-portfolios. Um, this has been sort of an interesting, <laughs> interesting project because apparently, you know, like I said, I'm fairly new there, but apparently there have been attempts to do this before. It's like, oh, we're going to do this with Google something, and we're going to do this with, you know, whatever. And they've all sort of fizzled out. And um, this time, the provost, having just signed a big contract with Epsilon, <laughs> said, okay, it's going to work this time. That wasn't a question. <laughs> it will work this time. Um, and so I think what's happened in the past is there's been a lot of that analysis paralysis where it's like, oh, let's see, so we could do this and, and we could do this and, and faced with a lot of choices, there's some real interesting research about when you're faced with a lot of choices, you're much more likely to just go, I, I'm just not going to choose. I'm not going to even choose one. Um, there was a, just a, an, an amazing study that they cite in the book, in fact, about um, physicians who were told, well, for this particular disease or whatever, there's this drug or surgery. Well, most physicians you know, aren't going to tell you, oh, you really need surgery, if you can be cured or, or at least helped by a drug. So the surgeons or the physicians would choose the drug. What's interesting is that when they told the surgeons, well, there are these three drugs that you could pick from or there's surgery, the number of surgeries went way up. Is that weird? But it's that idea of when we're faced with a lot of choices, we suddenly kind of get all overwhelmed and the elephant goes, oh my gosh, I don't know. I think I'll just like completely not even look at that and I'll just go this way. So I, I think that's partly what happened with e-portfolios in the past. It was like, oh, look, and you can do this, and you can do this, and you can do this. And people went, Wah! how about if I just don't do it at all? And they didn't. So yeah, for us, it's, we're definitely going to be focusing on clarifying, providing clarity in, to the rider. Look, you can do, here's one way to start. Do this one thing to start. And then the next step on that path is here. And the next step is here. Not look, there are 50 possibilities. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> People are like, no, no, it's not. So uh, that's one of the ways that we're going to introduce the e-portfolios using this new software. Because I think, I'm pretty sure that what happened in the past was that sort of, you know, we ended up sort of paralyzed because the rider, you know, was enjoying that sort of, oh my gosh, and look, we could do this, and, and we could plan, and, and the elephant, got all spooked about it. So um, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna tell people that I'm appealing to their elephant, their inner elephant, because that might not go over so well. But, yeah, uh, right. <laughs> yeah. As did with PowerPoint, in that once people know how to do one thing, they decide that a lot of things are really good, and you end up having 42 different transitions and 18 <laughs> different fonts. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. You can always right. tell the newbies to, to uh, PowerPoint. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we will hope that, that we don't end up with that sort of, you know, oh, look, well, look, I can put in the sound of applause in my PowerPoint, and then the next transition is like a train, you know, and it's like, oh, for Pete's sake. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to hope that that, that will involve scripting the moves. <laughs> then, with, yeah. No, I, I think it's great if people want to go in and play and explore. But yeah, that can, that can ultimately be a problem as well. Because then it ends up, you know, PowerPoint got such a bad reputation because of how poorly it was used. You know, and, and it's sort of like, oh, I hate PowerPoint. Well, that's because people used it stupidly, okay? It's not a stupid tool. It was just being used stupidly. So, you know, um, so it'll be important for us to, to be very clear about, you know, how to do this in an intelligent way. What other changes are you looking at? Anybody trying to lose weight? <laughs> this is a big one, and they, they actually write in the book about, about this, because um, in this case, the elephant is aptly named. Um, 
Because if you're trying to lose weight, the elephant is the one who sees the Twinkies and goes, <laughs> oh, you know, I can, I can convince the rider that this is, you know, this is going to be okay. You know. So um, they talk about quitting smoking and the program uh, to help people quit smoking. Um, you know, as I said before, uh, information doesn't change behavior, typically. No, it's something else that, that does it. It's typically an emotional appeal, whatever. But isn't it interesting that when smoking became sort of a social negative, you know, a down, kind of, kind of a negative thing, um, the amount of people, you know, the amount of smoking dropped. I think I'm out of time. Am I out of time? Yeah. I am out of time. It is. It is. So think about uh, using those motivational techniques, using things like social pressure, rallying the herd to change behaviors, not only information, because that's not going to be enough. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you.